All right, so we have, we have just finished up um, what happens when parathyroid hormone interacts with the bone. The parathyroid hormone also affects uh, also affects the kidneys as well. So we just went through this entire figure with PTH affecting the osteoblast, and you have a whole series of events that take place that leads towards the demineralization of the bone or the release of, of calcium into the bloodstream. So with um, the, the kidneys, we actually alter renal absorption. So we increase tubular reabsorption. Of calcium and tubular reabsorption is uh, a process that occurs that moves material from the urine in the in the tubule system of the kidney back into the bloodstream. So we're reabsorbing calcium rather than allowing it to go into the urine to be excreted. We also are going to have an increase in tubular reabsorption of magnesium. And then also an increase in excretion or the removal of the phosphate ion. Now, what's interesting about this excretion is we lose um, PO4 phosphate, PO4 3 minus. What actually happens here is it leads to an increase in calcium. The reason that it leads to an increase in calcium is because calcium phosphate is a very common binding substrate for calcium. So calcium will bind on the phosphate, form calcium phosphate. We've now reduced the ability to have calcium bind to that phosphate because we've removed the phosphate ion. And by reducing the calcium binding to this particular sub substrate, calcium remains as calcium, uh, in soluble calcium within the bloodstream. Okay, so a couple different things happening here in the kidneys uh, that lead towards an uh, increase of calcium in the bloodstream. Then the last thing that's going to happen here is in the intestines. So BTH is going to lead towards an increase in intestinal absorption, intestinal absorption of calcium. So the calcium that you consume from your diet uh, is going to be brought in. Now it's actually hypothesized that this may actually be an indirect effect. That it's not actually the PTH interacting with the intestinal cells that results in the increase in calcium. But we may actually have <laughs> this mechanism occurring here that leads towards the production of um, a variety of different bioactive proteins or molecules stemming from vitamin D. And so it's actually the PTH inducing the conversion of vitamin D precursors that leads towards the absorption or intestinal absorption of the calcium. Okay, so it's not actually PTH doing something to the um, intestinal cells themselves that bring in calcium, but we form vitamin D3, technically we form 125 dihydroxy vitamin D3, 
and vitamin D3 is actually going to lead to <coughs> things like transcription here of different, uh, different proteins that alter cell function. And there's a bunch of different things that alter cell function here. So osteoblast function, um, we have these increases in a couple different proteins in the, in the bone and the decrease in collagen leading towards calcium uh, demineralization from the bone. Macrophages and osteoclasts differentiate. And so we have some other proteins that, that uh, um, C-MYC and uh, beta-3 integrin that are going to change the uh, overall um, growth patterns in the bone leading towards a favorable release of calcium. The intestinal calcium and uh, uh, phosphate absorption through uh, some, some other proteins, the CAB-P proteins. Renal vitamin D catabolism leading to an enzyme that increases that helps out with calcium uh, uh, tubular reabsorption from the, from the kidney. So you have all of these different things. Parathyroid hormone synthesis actually is also induced in the presence of uh, vitamin D. Uh, uh, vitamin D3, 125, dehydroxy vitamin D3, and then immunomodulation, um, decreasing interleukin 2. So you have all of these different things that happen with vitamin D3 being converted into uh, 125-dihydroxy vitamin D3 that probably have effects on other physiological systems, uh, resulting in intestinal calcium being uh, absorbed. Uh, so we had a couple different uh, molecules that we started out with. This was all about PTH. Hopefully you'll remember that we also had a, a molecule called uh, parathyroid hormone-related peptide. And I want to talk a little bit about the physiological ro ro uh, roles of PTHRP. PTHRP. So the parathyroid hormone related peptide, it actually normally functions in a autocrine or a paracrine type mechanism. Okay, so normally it's autocrine or it's paracrine. However, occasionally there is possible effects outside of the adult human, uh, and in particular during fetogenesis. And so there may be some effects for this protein on the, the fetal physiology. So in an experiment uh, done in, in rats, if you remove the fetal parathyroid gland, so this is a surgical removal, We remove the fetal parathyroid glands. The result here is to actually induce low levels of calcium, which is kind of what we would expect based off of what we've seen above with parathyroid hormone. So we induce hypocalcemia. So if we take a blood sample, we're going to find very low levels of calcium. Now, if we follow up this surgical procedure and we inject parathyroid hormone, there is no observable effect. But if we inject parathyroid hormone-related peptide, this actually results in the restoration of the calcium levels. We restore calcium levels when we provide parathyroid hormone related peptide. So it's possible that during fetogenesis, parathyroid hormone related peptide is the putative calcium regulator. <clears throat> and it's not actually PTH. There may be some switch that happens where PTH takes over as the organism ages.
So I want to shift gears here just a little bit. And I want to talk about another calcium related hormone called calcitonin. A lot of times it's abbreviated just simply CT. Uh, so calcitonin is actually not produced by the parathyroid. It's going to be produced by the thyroid itself. And the normal physiology is when calcium levels increase above um, when calcium levels increase above homeostatic limits, and we want to bring them back down, with calcium, with calcitonin present, we're going to have a rapid drop in serum calcium levels. Okay, so it appears that when we have our hormones intact, including calcitonin, we normally respond by decreasing calcium levels after we've had a calcium level increase. So we're, we're militantly um, maintaining homeostatic uh, levels of, of, of calcium. If we perform a thyroidectomy, so that's removal of the thyroid, then as calcium levels increase, we observe no rapid drop in serum calcium. No rapid drop in serum calcium. We actually still see a drop. It's just not rapid. It's much slower. So calcium levels go up, and they come down very quickly with calcitonin present. When the thyroid's been removed, we have that increase in calcium, and they come down much, much slower. So they still decrease, but much slower. So when you histologically observe the calcium, uh, the uh, thyroid gland, rather, uh, you're going to actually find that there's multiple different types of cells. The cells that I want to hone in here to try to look at calcitonin function are a group of cells that are called the parafollicular cells, sometimes referred to as the C cells or the clear cells. Okay. So these are cells that are found in the thyroid, which, by the way, I have a whole uh, series of lectures on the thyroid. Right. So since we're dealing right now with um, calcium homeostasis in this in this section, um, calcitonin, even though it's produced by the thyroid, it's connected in because of calcium homeostasis. We'll circle the wagons and come back to um, the the other parts of the thyroid, T3 and T4 in particular. So the parathyroid, uh, I'm sorry, parafollicular cells or the C cells. These are cells that we find in the thyroid, and they are responsible to produce calcitonin, which is a 32 amino acid peptide. And it appears that the actions of calcitonin are opposite of what we observe with parathyroid hormones. So these are Two hormones that do opposite things. Parathyroid hormone will bring blood calcium levels up. Calcitonin will bring blood calcium levels back down. And we only bring blood calcium levels back down in response to an increase. So if we have an increase in calcium, this leads to the release of calcitonin. Once calcitonin is in the system, that will lead to a decrease in those calcium levels, hopefully back down homeostasis. So the question becomes, okay, well, from the parafollicular cells, how is this action going to be inferred? And so the first part of that question is to figure out how calcitonin is triggered to be released. And the answer to that 
comes from the C cells themselves. They also, much like we've seen with the cells of the parathyroid, are calcium receptors or have calcium receptors or calcium sensors. And so as calcium levels change, these receptors bind or do not bind that calcium, depending on the change that we're experiencing, and then respond accordingly with the release of calcitonin. So when calcium levels increase, those calcium receptors or calcium sensors bind more calcium, resulting in the release or the increased release of calcitonin. And then the converse is true as well, where if calcium levels drop, we no longer are binding those calcium receptors sensors, and so this results in a decrease in calcitonin release. So we're going to be looking for those calcium receptors or sensors to respond to calcium's results in the secretion of calcitonin. Once calcitonin is in the bloodstream, its effects are going to include changing the bone physiology. So calcitonin actually targets to the bone and decreases bone reabsorption by the osteo. So we decrease the function of the osteoclast. Remember the osteoclast is the bone breaker downer, right? This is the, the cell type that will break down bone and release calcium. So we, we actually reduce the osteoclast function. That means there's less bone reabsorption. More calcium remains inside of the bone. In the presence of calcitonin, the osteoclast it changes its function because calcitonin results in a change in the cell's morphology. Osteoclasts. A second effect for calcitonin is to alter renal physiology, so the kidneys once again. So we're actually going to increase renal calcium excretion which makes sense as well. If we have high levels of calcium in the blood, we're going to pull, pull more of that out and leave more of that calcium in the forming urine and pass it into the ureters in the uh, bladder for storage and eventual uh, ex excretion or expression into the toilet or on the tree. The calcitonin interacts specifically in the uh, in the kidney on the proximal convoluted tubule. So calcitonin receptors are present on the cells of the PCT. And if you're not really too familiar with renal physiology, you have the nephron, which interacts with the bloodstream, so that's blood supply. Uh, or not the nephron, I'm sorry, the, the Bowman's cap capsule, the glomerular capsule. And then you have this first length of the nephron, which is called the PCT, the proximal convoluted tubule. These are where the cells have the receptors for calcitonin. So when we take both the effects of the osteoclast and then the changes in the proximal convoluted tubule cells, the collective effect is a decrease in serum calcium levels, a decrease in zero calcium levels. So I started this part of the conversation with an experiment that showed that when you remove the thyroid, you actually still see calcium levels controlled. They just, the, the speed in which they're controlled changes. And so one of the questions that can be addressed is calcitonin really important? 
So when we remove the thyroid, we've already observed that there is no impact on calcium handling. We also observe no real bone metabolism issues. Which is kind of strange. We know that it does do some, some things physiologically, but those appear to be redundant with other systems that we have in mammals. Now, there's another uh, example that kind of takes us in the other direction, and that is a medullary thyroid carcinoma. So remember that the medullary cortex is on the outside of an organ, medullary is on the inside. So this medullary thyroid carcinoma increases the size and the activity of the C cells, of the parafollicular cells. Right? So this is a C cell tumor, and that C cell tumor responds by inducing extremely high levels of calcitonin. And so those extremely high levels of calcitonin you would expect would have some pretty profound effects, and it turns out that there's no real apparent effect on mineral homeostasis. So when thyroid levels are low, or when um, the thyroid is, is absent, calcitonin levels drop. We don't really have any apparent uh, issues with bone metabolism. When we have a C cell tumor pumping out large quantities of calcitonin, there appears to be no uh, effects or issues on mineral homeostasis. And so the argument may be put forward, well, maybe calcitonin is actually just a uh, vestigial hormone. It's kind of left over from our evolutionary past. But to address this question further, I want to talk about a disease called Paget's disease of the bone. Paget's disease of the bone. So with Paget's disease of the bone, normally the bones redistribute minerals. Normally, the bones redistribute minerals, and so we end up with bone being stronger in some areas and weak in other areas. And this is usually related to the application of force. It's strong in some areas, weak in other areas. <laughs> we're stronger where we have more forces that are being applied with our loc locomotion on our day or other stresses that we're uh, experiencing on a daily basis. In Paget's disease, which we have a x-ray scan on the bottom here, the bone on your left is normal. The bone on the right is abnormal. And I think you can see that it is abnormal. And so Paget's disease, you end up with these stronger and weaker areas going to a far extreme. Okay? So rather than having that normal distribution on the bone, responding with small changes over time, you have big changes over time. So an individual who has Paget's disease, when they are provided calcitonin, 
the result is an inhibition uh, of the actions of osteoclasts. And over time, this reduces the effects of the disease. And so it would appear that with calcitonin, that it, it does have these immediate effects on helping to balance calcium. But it also appears that it is a rate limiter on osteoclasts over the long time, over a long period of time. And so that you end up being able to maintain bone mineral density appropriately over time rather than having these big changes because of a, um, a loose running osteoclast or an osteoclast that's allowed to um, undergo its processes. Okay, so the next uh, molecule I want to take a look at here is called calcitonin gene-related peptide, CGRP. Calcitonin gene-related peptide has been shown to have effects on the brain and the heart and on the pulmonary system and the lungs. Calcitonin gene related peptide has these effects on these different areas. Uh, it's a potent vasodilator. It has the effect of relaxing smooth muscle, especially within our vessels. And then it also has been shown to be a possible neurotransmitter. Possible neurotransmitter. Now let me bring up calcium, uh, I'm sorry, uh, calcitonin gene related peptide here. Um, just because it's related to calcitonin, it's really not a calcium homeostasis gene, but this is a good place to fit this in. So just a little deviation there uh, before we move on to our final calcium handling protein. Yes, potent vasodilator. So our last uh, protein here involving calcium homeostasis is called telmodulin. Telmodulin a lot of times is abbreviated as CAM, capital C, lower A, uppercase M, or it sometimes will be called calcium dependent regulatory protein. Calcium dependent regulatory protein. Okay, so this is what calmodulin looks like. You can see that it's a, uh, it's a pretty large protein, a pretty large peptide. Calmodulin is actually going to act as a intra- cellular calcium receptor, neurotransmitter. So it's an intracellular calcium receptor, intracellular inside of the cell. Calcium receptor binds to calcium. It's got a total of 148 amino acids in its monomer form, monomeric form. Calmodulin is found in all eukaryotic cells, and the term that we use to describe that is called ubiquitous. If I can spell that correctly. So this is a ubiquitous uh, protein that we find in all eukaryotic cells. 
Now, what you're looking at here in the figure is you're going to see that you have these four different loop structures. One, two, three, four. Those are the calcium binding sites. So, calmodulin possesses four binding locations for calcium. And what we have found is that calmodulin, when it binds calcium, it's going to depend on the number of calcium uh, atoms that are bound in order to do, induce a conformational change. Okay? So if I, when I bind three or four of the sites with calcium, this will undergo a conformational switch. Now, what happens when I bind something to a protein? That protein changes its shape, which changes its function. Okay. So I need to actually have three or four calcium ions bind to calmodulin in order for that conformational switch to occur, leading to activation. If I have zero, one, or two, the calmodulin remains in its inactive conformation. So once calmodulin is activated, there are three major roles that it plays within the cell. Three major roles. And this is what you can see going on in this figure here. This is the mechanisms of action. Okay. So we'll have a hormone that stimulates the movement of calcium either from the extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid or a lot of times from endoplasmic reticulum or if we're dealing with a muscle cell when I call it sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium begins to load up in the cell. Calmodulin can be bound and it gets into its active form if we have three or four calcium that have been bound. And this results in downstream proteins being activated, leading to the physiological change. So what are the physiological changes? Major role number one is for chemodulin to act as a regulator of intracellular calcium levels. So it will regulate the intracellular levels of calcium. The second activity of calmodulin is to actually act as a type of protein kinase where I activate proteins that are enzymes. And then I get a series of different chemical reactions that can start in the cell. And then the last thing that calmodulin has been shown to do is to provide some control of the cellular fragmentation or filamentation process, rather. Uh, so control of cellular filamentous organelle activity. So it has these effects on things like the cytoskeleton in the cell uh, and the, the conduits that are used to move vesicles around, uh, around the cell. We're going to shift gears now. We're going to talk about gastrointestinal and the transaction. That's a good job, wasn't it?
I don't. I came up with that on my own. Yeah, so this would be a new lecture. This is chapter number 10 in the textbook, uh, Gastrointestinal Endocrinology. And I want to start out with a survey of the gastrointestinal hormones. Gastrointestinal hormones. And I'm going to identify four major peptides. Four major peptides. Okay? There's also some others, and we're going to talk about those others as well, but there are four major gastrointestinal peptides. These are gastrin, secretin, cholecystokinin, or CCK, and then the last is gastric inhibitory peptide. GIP. Okay, so these are the four major gastrointestinal uh, peptides, kind of what would be considered the, the classics in gastrointestinal hormones. We actually now, we're going to come back and we'll go through mechanisms of action, etc. for these. Uh, but there's actually some others now. Uh, in fact, uh, the most recently discovered hormones are actually gastrointestinal hormones. And so there are other now recognized hormones of the gastrointestinal tract. And there have been two that have been recently discovered. And when I say recently, um, we're basically about 20 years out from their discovery now. It's cholecystokinin. CCK. It's all one word. So it's a lowercase k. Okay, so we have these two recently discovered hormones. Uh, and really, these molecules are known. They just are not known to have had endocrine effects. And now we've shown that there are some endocrine effects for these two hormones. Uh, so the first one is a hormone that's called ghrelin. And I'm going to give you a little bit more on ghrelin uh, right now. But the other one is ovastat. And we'll talk about ovastat and we can talk a little bit more about ovastat as well. So ghrelin is actually a hunger hormone related to appetite. So a hunger hormone that's related to appetite. It opposes the effects of another hormone called leptin. So these two hormones, ghrelin and leptin, are in this sort of uh, this sort of balance. Leptin is not a gastrointestinal hormone specifically. It's actually produced in the adipose tissue. adipose-derived hormone. In leptin, what it does is it stimulates well, what um, ghrelin does is it stimulates the feeling of fullness. No, I'm sorry, switch that. Um, leptin stimulates the feeling of fullness. Ghrelin increases before a meal to stimulate appetite, and then it decreases after a meal. 
after satiety uh, have been have been achieved. Ghrelin acts through a G protein linked receptor. And the receptor that it binds to, I'm gonna I'm gonna screw this up in pronunciation, but I'll, I'll try to get it there. It binds to what's called the growth hormone secretagogue receptor, like synagogue, but secretagogue. So it's growth hormone secretagogue. So the G protein is specifically the growth hormone secretagogue receptor. Which causes growth hormone release from the anterior pituitary. Now, strangely enough, it actually may also have a brain physiology role as well. And it may also play a part in the learning process. And so that old adage that breakfast is the most important part of the day and that you need to eat breakfast before you go to school to learn, there may actually be a physiological fact behind that related to growing. So ghrelin recently discovered, and then the other hormone that's recently been, been, been discovered to extend the four that we've just talked about, um, or just introduced briefly just a few minutes ago, uh, is ovastat. And ovastatin is actually cleaved from the ghrelin gene. So GHRL is ghrelin, that's the abbreviation. Obostatin comes from that gene. So technically, the ghrelin gene, even though it's an active gene and produces active ghrelin, it's also a pre-pro uh, pre hormone. A pre-pro hormone. It allows the production of this hormone called obostatin. Obostatin, we don't know near as much about. One of the things that is hypothesized is that it may actually have effects that oppose the actions of ghrelin. So eventually, I want to get back into our uh, gastrointestinal hormones. But before we can do that, uh, I think it's probably a, appropriate to go through the gastrointestinal tract and provide some uh, discussion on the, the anatomy here. Okay, so the, the term that we use to describe the gastro, 
gastrointestinal system is a lot of times, uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll refer to it as the gastrointestinal tract. And really, the, the term tract just simply means that we have this big, long tube that begins at the mouth and ends at the anus. And we have that pathway that leads through multiple different types of structures that all provide different interactions. So when you consume a meal, the digestion process that begins in the mouth, and you have your teeth, which are um, uh, food processing uh, devices to begin to break apart that food, we eventually have to get that food from its macro structure down to individual molecules, and in, in really our macromolecules like individual amino acids, lipids, individual saccharides, uh, and nucleic acids. And so the routes in the inter the route in the interaction that we take through the trap, it starts when food enters the mouth, and you begin to chew. Your teeth grind up the food and begin to mix that food with saliva. So we put the food enters the mouth, chew, the, the, the teeth begin to chew and mix that food up, and saliva is incorporated. Now, from the salivary glands, the saliva is being produced to contain what's known as alpha or salivary amylase. What is alpha or salivary amylase? Anyone know? What do we know? Is there anything you can tell me about that molecule? It is an enzyme. Anyone know what it acts on? It acts on a molecule called amylose. What is amylose? It's a type of sugar. Do you know specifically what type of sugar? The other name for amylose is starch. So this is the branched chain storage molecule for glucose in plants. And so when you consume a meal, hopefully you're eating fruits and vegetables, with each of your meals, you begin your starch digestion here in the mouth. Okay? And remember, this is all about going from the whole hamburger down to the individual macromolecules that make up that whole hamburger. So we're beginning to not only mechanically break down the food by chewing, but we're mixing in this salivary amylase, and this begins the chemical digestion process as well. So after we have sufficiently chewed up our food and mixed it with saliva, that's swallowed into the esophagus. So when you swallow, you push that what's called bolus of food into the esophagus and peristalsis, you don't have any control over peristalsis, peristalsis basically sweeps that food down the esophagus and deposits it into the stomach. Now, the esophagus really has very little going on besides just transport from the oral cavity down to the stomach. We don't have any enzymes incorporated or anything like that. We're just using that basically as a conduit to move the meal into the stomach. Now, when we enter the stomach, we first enter through what's known as the lower esophageal sphincter. So this is a drawstring type closure 
that kind of separates the esophagus from the stomach. So the food comes in, that drawstring-like closure, smooth muscle, opens up food, deposits into the stomach, and as it deposits into the stomach, the food begins to be churned and mixed. And in the stomach, we form a solution called chyme. This is all of the food that's been mixed up with a solution of different types of acids and enzymes that are in the stomach. It is this material that's actually going to be released in small packets or boluses into the small intestine. So your stomach ends up being a storage site. It mixes everything up. You have both mechanical kind of churning and also chemical, chemical digestion occurring, breaking the food down further and further and further. We get a solution, and then we deposit small packets from the stomach into the small intestine. So esophagus comes down. This is the stomach here. Stomach acts as storage, and then we deposit just small packets, just small little, you know, like probably 30 milliliters or so at a time into the small intestine. So that small little packet is called a bolus. And that bolus moves through a sphincter on the bottom of the stomach called the pyloric sphincter. And as it enters into as it enters into the small intestine, it's going to traverse the different segments of the small intestine. And each of these different segments, they're not differentiated anatomically, they're differentiated, well, that's not entirely true. Let me restate that. They're not differentiated based off of their gross anatomy. They're differentiated based off of the physiology and then their microscopic anatomy. So the first about 10 or 12 inches of the small intestine is called the duodenum or the duodenum. Duodenum is more common, although I've heard it both ways. From the duodenum, we move into the jejunum. From the jejunum, we move into the ileum. Now, in the duodenum, the duodenum has an opening to what's called the common, uh, the common bile duct. And the common bile duct connects up both the gallbladder and also the pancreas. And so we deposit this solution called uh, gastric juice or um, uh, pancreatic juice into the small intestine through the uh, through the common bile ducts into the small intestine. This neutralizes the acids that were present in the stomach that began protein digestion and adds in a couple other enzymes, including another starch uh, digesting enzyme. So to do what them, the main purpose there is to continue uh, uh, chemical digestion by adding in more cocktail uh, of, of different uh, enzymes into, into the, the bolus that's just been released. Then as you move into the jejunum and the ileum, the main process there is extraction of nutrients. Okay, so what we would call digestive absorption. So all the way up to the duodenum, everything is about breaking down or digesting the food. Once you get into the jejunum and the ileum, we're going to begin to extract out nutrients. And so by the time we get to, je to the jejunum and ileum, hopefully we have our individual amino acids, lipids, individual nucleic acids, individual saccharides. After food has been passed through and nutrients have been pulled out from the jejunum and the ileum, we're going to be left over with undigested material. And that undigested material is also going to have incorporated water. And so it's this undigested material and water that enters into the colon. 
Once we're in the colon, we're going to have some additional absorption of water. And that begins to cause this undigested material to begin to solidify, forming what we're going to refer to as feces or solid fecal material. That solid fecal material is then moved from the colon and is evacuated through the rectum and the anus into the environment or into uh, a toilet, depending on what kind of moisture you want. Now, we had a lot of different movement that was going on here, and I want to talk just really briefly about the, the different types of movements that we have to propel food. So the movement to propel food from one end of the track to the other end of the track is accomplished by smooth muscle. And we basically have smooth muscle down the entire length of the tube through the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine. Uh, we have two to three different layers of smooth muscle oriented in different directions. Most of the tube has two layers, the stomach has a third layer. And so if you look kind of around the tube, you're going to have some of the smooth muscle that's around that tube. We call that um, cross-sectional, a cross-sectional layer. And then you have some that kind of runs the length of the tube, kind of longitudinally. Inside of the stomach, you kind of have the in-between. You have some layers that are sort of at an oblique angle. Okay? So we have two to three different directions of smooth muscle around the tube and around the sac of the stomach. Right. So the first type of movement that is induced is a type of movement known as peristalsis. Peristalsis. So here's what your kind of smooth muscle orientation looks like. Uh, this is a bolus of food here. And so what you can see is that bolus of food kind of causes a stretching where the bolus is. And then behind you have sort of a contraction. So going in this direction, the, the, sorry, the bolus stretches the tube. Here it contracts the tube. And so it squeezes behind, which propels it forward. You have kind of this wave-like motion all the way down the tube shown right here these wave-like motion of contracting and relaxing in front of, in, behind and in front of the tube is what's known as peristalsis, okay? The other type of movement that we have, which is much more common in the small intestine, is segmentation. So peristalsis occurs in, in all of the tubes, but primarily occurs only, or, but, uh, I'm sorry, but then segmentation primarily occurs only in the intestine. We don't see segmentation in the esophagus, just peristalsis. Segmentation is this idea of taking uh, like a, a tube of toothpaste. Let's say you had a really big tube of toothpaste. Segmentation is these random contractions that cause the material in the tube to kind of be mixed up. Okay? So peristalsis is forward direction. Segmentation is mixing as we go along. And the reason we mix as we go along, you know, we're dealing with the tube. And so you may have some food stuffs or, or molecules out here that aren't interacting the same uh, way that the, the food or the material on the outside is. And so segmentation causes this kind of mixing where the stuff that's in the middle gets exposed out to the outside where it's being absorbed. So um, what we'll pick up with on Thursday, we'll, we'll actually talk about the nervous system innervation that we have to the, um, to, the, to the gastrointestinal system. We'll talk about that nervous system innervation 
uh, and how that actually um, helps to regulate the process as well. I'm going to go ahead and stop here. This is a good stopping point.